Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly libertarian podcast from the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Happy mid May, comrades. Howdy. Hey, Matt. Happy Monday. We are going to dip our toes into the turgid torrents of the Rio Grande here in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors at Donors Trust, the principled and tax-friendly way to simplify your charitable giving. Friends, did you know that left-wing mega donors are shoveling money into pet projects that don't reflect American values? Lawmakers continue to push bloated big government policies like so-called student loan cancellation that invariably raise prices and fail to improve the underlying problems. All is not lost, however. You can help turn the tide with a charitable giving account at Donors Trust. Donors Trust is a refuge from the storm of harmful progressive philanthropy and big government wheeling and dealing that hurts not just our institutions, but our loved ones. Donors Trust helps you maximize your giving while minimizing your tax liability. Whether it's defending free speech, funding educational alternatives, or fighting green energy extremists, Donors Trust is the charitable giving account provider for you. Visit www.donorstrust.org slash reason to learn more. That's www.donorstrust.org slash reason to learn more about how Donors Trust can minimize your tax liability and maximize your giving. Yes, visit www.donorstrust.org slash reason today. You'll be glad you did. Okay, on Friday, President Joseph Robinette Biden II lifted one of the last remaining federal emergency pandemic restrictions, a March 2020 Donald Trump order called Title 42. Title 42, whose authorizing statute stipulates that it shall be deployed to prevent the, quote, introduction of diseases into the United States, was used for 38 months to change the way that border officials process asylum requests. Before that, refugees defined as people unable or unwilling to return to their home countries due to past persecution or a well-founded fear of future persecution could arrive at a port of entry, apply for asylum, and then be released inside the country as they awaited a hearing, a practice colloquially known and criticized as uh, catch and release. Title 42 instead just told people knocking at America's front door to turn around and go back. Uh, an estimated 2.7 million such expulsions have happened since then, many of them uh, repeated attempts by the same people. Uh, in the run-up to Title 42 finally ending on Friday, masses of immigrants began surging towards and sometimes wading across the southern border. Just chaotic scenes on TV. Then Biden announced a replacement policy. He'd been teasing it before, one that resembles Title 42 quite a bit, uh, telling applicants that they need to go back to Mexico and apply through a government app. The enforcement of the new rules appears preliminarily to have dissipated the swarm at the border, at least over the weekend, while drawing critics both from right and left, including a lawsuit from the ACLU. Catherine uh, Reasons Elizabeth Nolan Brown, if that is a real name, did one of those uh, question headline thingies on Friday. Uh, is Biden replacing bad immigration policy with worse immigration policy? So how do you, Catherine, answer that question? Yeah, I will say like the asterisk on the answer to question headlines is always no is, you know, actually, usually question headlines are like, this is a tough one. And uh, this is a tough one. So um happy to see Title 42 revisited at long last. And of course, it did not achieve one little smidge of its public health goals, as far as anyone can tell. And I'm sure that that's controversial because there are lots of people who will want to claim that. Um, keeping people out did help our COVID numbers. I don't know of any strong evidence for that and highly doubt it. Um, but yeah, you know, there is no party of immigration in this country right now. There is no party that is like, hey, what it says on the Statue of Liberty, let's do that thing. And <laughs> um, Biden campaigned a little bit like maybe he was going to be that guy. And I will be continuing to hold it against him that he turned out not to be. Hasn't he, though, uh, changed some policies and uh, done things that are not pure continuations of his predecessor. 
Yes, absolutely. There have been th- some things that are better. And, you know, I I do think um, with some of Trump's policies, as the left was fond of like embroidering on napkins or whatever, the cruelty was the point. But the underlying, you know, effect on the world is not substantially different under Biden. I, I really, really wish it was. He fixed some stuff. He's 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 a smidge better. But there is just there are just still millions of people who want to come here who should be able to come here, who would be an asset to our country, who are being told in just more complicated and more polite language that they still can't come here. Peter, uh, Catherine talked about the public health kind of rationale and implications of the thing. If you can uh, talk us through with your trademark brevity and wit, what those uh, implications are, um, uh, even just in terms of the government's authority to use public health as a reason to do a big thing. Uh, So because this is named Title 42, I feel like I have to make a Douglas Adams reference. Yes. Right. And in the way that you have to. Yes. It's it's it's, in your contract. Right. So in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, they, of course, set up a giant machine to discover what the answer to life, the universe and everything is. And it turns out that it's 42. Well, for policymakers during the pandemic, the coronavirus was the answer to life, the universe and everything. It literally was an excuse to do absolutely anything you wanted to do, whether or not it had anything to do with the coronavirus. And hence, we got Title 42 out of that because Title 42 was just an excuse to turn people away and to keep uh, uh, asylum seekers out and to be much more aggressive uh, uh, with asylum seekers than uh, we otherwise would have been. And the, that's all it was. It was just it was just like we already wanted to do this. And because of that, because of the of the pandemic, we're going to go ahead and do that. And so there's it's probably illegal. I mean, right now there's a bunch of litigation. This will uh, the end of Title 42 will probably uh, stop that litigation. But if you think about what they what this basically said was the CDC has the power to be to like just decide immigration policy for the country. That's not how the CDC works. So we've talked a lot on this podcast about how the CDC played national landlord during the pandemic for some parts of it. But they also were playing national border enforcement and border policy organization. And that is not how public health works. That is not a power the CDC has. And yet it is a power that the CD took and held on to for several years uh, via Title 42. It's so in addition to all of the kind of specific bad immigration effects here, it's also just a huge huge power grab by public health authorities that is probably going to have some very bad uh, knock on consequences in the in coming years. Nick, you like to describe yourself as being in favor of open borders. Um, How do you explain to an average American watching their TV set, an average libertarian podcast bro uh, out there keeping it real uh, that I'm right here, Matt, that the chaos that they're looking at um, would be improved by a Gillespian open borders regime? Well, you know, first, Matt, I want to point out because uh, 42, of course, is a famous number in the history of baseball. Correct. And I really need to <laughs> talk about how the real problem is that it's besmirching the uh, legacy of Jackie Robinson, uh, who I think would have been in favor of letting more people cross the border, especially if they could do any combination of hit, field, or uh, or bunt. But... Um, the, no, uh, you know, uh, well, there's there's a couple of things to think about here. And I, I you know, we're going to be talking about other topics that are related to this. What it what we're witnessing throughout every almost every aspect in terms of federal policy is like a complete systems failure. We are a fat old man who did not take care of himself at all at any time during a 225 year lifetime. And now they're is complaining. Is that the royal we? Yes, it is the royal re- we for a democratic republic, right? But it's, you know, it, it's like everything is falling apart and the immigration system is probably more like that than anything else. And one of, you know, the main issue here is that for decades now, at least since the late 80s, we have not had comprehensive immigration reform because neither of the parties, you know, and, and Matt, you have documented, I think, more fully than anyone I know in kind of political journalism about how in the 90s, it was the Democrats who were the party against immigration, especially illegals, you know, and then that flips and switches 
uh, with predictability, you know, depending on who's in office and, and a variety of other things. But our immigration policy is broken. And so every aspect of it is broken. It's like a fractal, you know, uh, absolute foobar, you know. Um, so the problem here is that you know, you have to start with the reality or the understanding that governments do not control mass migrations. From time to time, they can control borders. Uh, and, you know, and totalitarian countries are pretty good at keeping people locked within their countries. Uh, but that's about it. Over time, it just, the borders become more fluid. What's going on now is there are a number of countries in Central America in particular that have really awful uh, economies, awful cultures, awful political systems. And there is a surge of people who want to get out. And it's independent of whatever the U.S. is doing. That's kind of the backdrop. Um, and then on top of it is the fact that we as a country have not done anything to really significantly increase the processing capacity, uh, particularly along the southern border. Biden has done some good things on this, and it's worth noting that uh, he is better than Trump in a in a basic, limited but profound way. Um, but that's the big issue here. To get to your more specific point. Um, you know, I was looking, uh, Alex Narasta is is one of the people that I look to for, you know, good immigration uh, analysis. He is very pro more open immigration, which is how really how I define myself as well, because open borders is simultaneously a, a meaningless phrase and one that is fraught with things like that. But the fact of the matter is, is that when immigrants come here, whether they're legal or illegal, they use less welfare than, uh, than they consume and they add to you know the public resources first and foremost in terms of, of goods and services provided uh, and secondly in, in terms of things like taxes paid. The immigration system that we had up through you know the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 19th century and then the European uh, restriction acts that effectively choked off Europeans uh, starting in a, in a big way in the 1920s, the policy that we had before that worked very well. Um, and it worked because most of the people, overwhelming majority of people who come here, want to come here to live and work peacefully and productively. Um, and the, you know, this gets to a larger question. You can do cost benefit analyses. Im immigrants do not cost us money when they show up, uh, you know, but people aren't going to believe that. I think the, the solution is first having an immigration system that allows more people to be checked to make sure that they don't have communicable diseases or violent criminal histories. Absent that, anybody should be allowed to come here. Uh, you can meter it out because if everybody knows this is true, instead of waiting on a hypothetical you know, list for 25 years to come from Mexico, if you know you're going to come in two or three years because we're actually processing people, that would, re that would reduce some of the tension on the southern border as well. Um, we are in a uh, beyond the system failure of immigration and of the economy and of, of government debt that we're going to be talking about in a little bit. Um, we don't have a national purpose uh, or, or not a national purpose, a national identity that will allow us to take in uh, anybody. Um, and that's also a major system failure. Like we need a way of understanding how America is, should be, and always will be, whether we like it or not, a country of immigrants, if we want it to be a place that anybody wants to live. Catherine, um, let's talk about some of the ways in which the Biden administration is different than the Trump administration. One of the uh, innovations or moves that the administration has done is launched a thing called humanitarian parole, uh, first in Ukraine, I think, maybe uh, the Afghanistan had some overlap, uh, and now for uh, Latin American countries that are kind of basket cases. This hands out two-year visas to refugees who pass a Nick Gillespie background check and have private sponsors guaranteeing that they'll take care of them for two years. What um, policy lessons should we or have we learned from that? I mean, we... This is a rare case where uh, we tried something, it worked, and we learned the right lesson, as far as I can tell. So uh, a surprise kudos to the U.S. of A. for that one. When you let people in under these clearly defined conditions, um, you know, it, it works. Like, you have not, in fact, heard about the massive wave of, like, crime and disease and dysfunction and cultural decay caused by the fact that we've let in really, you know, quite a few 
quite a few immigrants under these programs. Um, but it still has this kind of deep fundamental misunderstanding, which is like somehow Joe Biden can tell based on your country of origin who deserves to come here. Right. Like there's this notion of like the worthy immigrant. And I think it really it really um, corrupts a lot of the conversation around immigration the same way that we are, you know, those of us who are old enough to remember, like the concept of the deserving poor. Right. Like there's just it's to try and divide people into these categories doesn't make sense. Like, oh, if you're fleeing socialism, you can come, I guess. Or this specific war that happens to have currently captured the national attention, you can come. Or maybe like the war we started and destroyed your country with, like, sorry about that. Um, Come on over. Like, it's not that those aren't defensible. They are. But there are plenty of people in countries not on these lists who live just like manifestly worse lives, who are who are struggling much more because of the political or social nature of the place that they're coming from. Um, so it's just weird to make a list that's like just this little list for whatever reason, you guys get an easier path in. That said, any additional person who comes in under a clearly defined path peaceably, I'm for it. And this is um, for those who uh, enjoyed Brian Kaplan's uh, comic book about immigration. Um, the last chunk of that is basically like, OK, I've done my best to convince you about open borders. But if I haven't convinced you, here are all the concessions that we could theoretically make that would still let more people in. Uh, and we could I'm open to making those two is kind of his rhetorical stance. And I, I guess I agree with him on that. Hey, Catherine, I, I'm actually just curious about something you said there. You you said you know, the, we've uh, let people in under these this rubric, and yet we've not heard about this massive wave of crime and, dis and disease and decay. And I guess my question is, haven't we? I mean, wasn't Title 42 predicated on preventing disease? And aren't Republicans saying in part that Biden's border policy is responsible for upticks and crime in crime in disarray in cities? I, mean, I feel like I am hearing the argument that like San Francisco is scuzzy because of Biden's border policy, that New York is uh, like has become a crime ridden hellhole again because of Biden's border policy. I'm not saying I agree with that, but I do feel like that is that is a, an argument that is being made in our politics right now. I, yeah, I will slightly amend what I said. I think there was a moment a few years ago when there was like, um, you know, the there were some very narrow arguments that were being made. It was like, you know, there were a couple of stories of um, like a specific, um, you know, drug trafficking story or whatever. I feel like, though, just as a matter of political gamesmanship, most of the energy there shifted to just being mad about what's going on at the border itself, which is a totally different causal story. So, yes, you're right. There was a minute when, like, as a messaging strategy, some Republicans experimented with it's Biden's fault that that man is screaming in Spanish on the street corner in San Francisco. But I don't think it took off. And I think that's because people recognize that that didn't match up with their reality. There was also, you know, there was that spate of stories of how illegal immigrants drunk driving were killing beautiful blonde children, you know, on the on the San, uh, you know, at Fisherman's yeah. Wharf. But, the, but in that's San Francisco. Eternal, right? That peaked. No. Yeah. But I mean, you actually don't hear that very much. And one of the things that's interesting Living in New York City, which is, you know, catching up to San Francisco as the, you know, patient zero of, of American urban decline. Uh, nobody talks about it. It isn't immigrant homeless people that are being choked to death. It isn't, you know, it's not, God, I just miss the days when it, I could understand insane homeless people screaming at me before they die of a fentanyl overdose. Um, it's been deracialized in a way, or, or rather de-immigrantized. It might be that it's black people. Um, but you don't really hear that very much. And I think partly it's because it reflects, you know, it, Republicans are not bound, like all politicians are not bound by reality. But the fact of the matter is, is that the, you know, when people complain in New York City, and Matt, help me out here, uh, or, or disagree with me. Um, Matt, you're it a person who complains in New York City. <laughs> no, but it isn't, it's not, they're not, ups, it's not immigrants causing the street level urban decay. Uh, unless you're going to say, oh, well, you know, uh, old Chinese ladies are such easy targets, uh, you know, for people who punch them in the face that we need to get rid of them. It's it's not about immigration, at least I, I find in, in New York, uh, you know, in, in discussions of 
urban problems. I don't necessarily agree with your two characterizations about that in that, for example, um, just this past week, uh, New York Mayor Eric Adams announced that um, he is going to open up sc three schools, three public schools, um, not in Manhattan, incidentally, um, uh, to house uh, migrants who are coming here, the uh, migrant populations. Uh, he also announced that he can no longer, he's going to have to amend <clears throat> the standing New York City rule where you have basically a right to shelter. That's why you don't have a lot of tents uh, in New York. Um, but that uh, the system has been overwhelmed by migrants in a way, and he's trying to get relief from the Biden administration. So it's part of the conversation. There's, you know, some of the ho hotels around Port Authority um, have been swollen with migrants, and and then they were shipped off to uh, a, a facility near IKEA, not far from where I live. And then they're all yeah. mad because they're... and he wants to send them to Newburgh. Yeah. I've definitely, uh, yeah, I've definitely fate worse than hell. I've definitely heard Republicans tie immigration policy to upticks in violence related to to gang members, and um, also. Uh, I've heard Republicans talk a lot about how Biden's border policy is uh, responsible for fentanyl uh, overdoses, and which is a, a little bit of a different thing, but it's related to what Catherine was saying. And so I, I guess I just sort of, I, I feel like uh, Republicans, to a, to a great extent, and in other, in some ways, centrist Democratic mayors are responding to Biden's border policy by saying this is too open, uh, you're letting too many people in and it's causing all sorts of social ill. And I, I you know, I, I think that's I think that's unfortunate. But I do think that there is a a messaging response coming from the political system right now, coming in our political discourse, saying that it is that immigrants are to blame for the problems that society is having. Yeah, I just want to put one more asterisk on here, which is like, I guess I, what I was talking about more specifically there was the humanitarian parole stuff in Matt's question, yeah. right? Like, okay. no one That's is fair. saying we have a wave of Ukrainian crime. No one is saying we have a wave of Haitian crime. And I think that, like, yes, the border is controversial. Yes, the, you know, there is a, for sure Republican rhetoric around Democratic border policies. But the the it's a it's a quite significant influx of a fairly wide variety of immigrants from these countries that have this special status and that as far as i know has not invoked has not like evoked a kind of the same response well let's let's yeah i i'm thinking back to like 10 years ago when people were talking about ms 13 every crime that was committed in a mall in arlington virginia was linked to ms 13 a dangerous mesoamerican gang when's the last time you heard people worrying about that it's about wokeness now and not treat it not immediately arresting all homeless people who are mentally ill i would predict that given the fact we're just now seeing the beginning of the 2024 presidential primary campaign and given the fact that the leader um uh, dominant leader so far in the republican party is donald trump whose um 2016 campaign in the primaries predicated on talking about um, the criminals that were coming in uh, from Mexico and other places and uh, talking a lot about sanctuary cities and talking a lot about a murder in San Francisco in particular. Um, I predict we'll hear more about this um, and that's going to be part of the ongoing conversation. In addition to, Peter, I think it was you were saying the sort of the fentanyl, the uh, the kind of unspecific wave your hands fentanyl border. If you just get those in a sentence, uh, J.D. Vance uh, wants to have you believe then you can win any election you want. Um, uh, you're going to hear a lot of like crazy. We need to bomb Mexico. Um, to, we got to bomb the fentanyl out of Mexico. And then and only then can we make the sanctuary city safe. All right. That's enough free association on this particular topic for now. The uh, Congressional uh, Budget Office last week, Friday, I believe, came out with an updated budget look for the next decade. Increasing the projected 2023 deficit to $1.5 trillion. Um, uh, I, I looked this up, so this must be true I, on the internet. If you stack up uh, $1.5 trillion um, dollar bills, it would go up 100,000 miles, which is halfway to the moon. I just think that's kind of cool. Uh, this report uh, comes in the midst, obviously, of ongoing discussions between President Biden and congressional Republicans over raising the debt ceiling borrowing limits. Um, Peter, you eat CBO reports for breakfast. Uh, what should um, taxpayers and political consumers uh, take from these updated numbers? That's a lot of money, like a whole <laughs> lot of money. 
I, I like your moon analogy because it does suggest a, a line of political messaging here that that you love, Matt, very specifically, was, which is we need a moonshot for deficit Oof. reduction. Right. We need to we need to have a, 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 a smaller stack of moon money. <laughs> <laughs> sold this is the only moonshot that say, Matt Welch will ever sign on to uh, no, did listen, I, uh, listen go before you go on uh, before you go on let's talk about my best headline as editor of Reason Magazine was on my own let's call let's do it call, good no, night I'd moonshot I like believe it's still in front of you good night moonshot that's great go on Peter uh, so you said one point five trillion dollars. That's this fiscal year. But as the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget has already pointed out, the deficit over the last 12 calendar months is already about two trillion dollars. So that's another however many miles towards the moon. Right. Like uh, it, it, in moon dollars, like we're, we're much closer to the moon than even your analogy made us uh, sound in the, the R- most 116,000 aggravating thing about this is that Biden keeps making as like a central argument, not like an offhanded thing that's unscripted, like a little footnote here and there. No, as like a central argument, he keeps claiming that he has cut the deficit. And it is true that the deficit has fallen from its uh, pandemic era peak, but his claim is based on the planned expiration of pandemic emergency spending, which most of which was a bad idea. Uh, but like we, we spent it and and it was mostly deficit spending, about six trillion dollars there. And so he's saying that because there was not another trillion dollars or another two trillion dollars in additional pandemic spending, that because of that, he cut the deficit. This is like me saying I am cutting my household spending by not buying more bottles of overpriced collector whiskey or hi-fi stereo equipment. Like every bottle of Pappy I don't buy is saving me thousands of dollars, right? Every time I don't buy a, a pair of handmade Jod divorce speakers, right? Like those, it's thousands of dollars that are, that are, that we're saving as a result. That, that is not how savings work. Savings work when you spend less, not when the money that you already spent stops spend stops spending. Uh, right. So anyway, we're getting closer to the moon and it's really bad and it's a huge amount of money. And just just to one more point of context here that I like to think about about 13 or 14 years ago, Congress spent a year or so debating Obamacare, right? De- debating the, the legislation that would become the Affordable Care Act. And there were multiple versions of that legislation. And one of the big problems with the early versions was that the Congressional Budget Office kept scoring them as costing over a trillion dollars in the first 10 years. And so eventually they pulled a bunch of tricks, basically delaying a bunch of the spending and uh, doing a, you know, sort of in- including a bunch of other stuff to sort of artificially bring the, the cost down. So they got the total price tag down to nine hundred and forty billion dollars for over 10 years. Uh, that that was almost a trillion dollars over a decade. And it was a huge amount of money. And it was so much money that the initial amounts, they were like, that's too much. We can't we can't spend that. And now we're looking at like I said, a two trillion dollar deficit just in the last 12 months alone, one point five trillion dollars uh, on, on the table for this calendar year. And deficits are projected to go up and up and up over the next decade. Uh, Catherine, you live in D.C. Uh, I get the impression from the outside that there are some like stalwart beltway Democrats and journalists trying to get us all scared about the coming um, you know, default on the de- global collapse, the default of the debt because the Republicans are are nihilists or something like that. But like, it doesn't feel like it's catching. I don't I don't see a lot, a lot of actual uh, panic from that, especially when Mitch McConnell's out there every single time saying we will not ever default on the debt ever, not even once. Um, what's your sense of the uh, the panic level in D.C. about uh, these negotiations? Yeah, I think we might have collectively reached some kind of like national panic satiation <laughs> level, like all of our panic is maxed out. <laughs> but now we don't have any panic left for yeah. the moon pile. And it's <laughs> it's not the right. We did the wrong panic is what I'm saying. And I wish I wish we could reallocate our panic. But at this point. I'm not confident about that. I um, 
I was Googling around because um, while I ha- I do have high levels of ambient panic about the national debt, I don't have um, sort of a, the interest in following it day to day that other people on this uh, podcast might have. So I was like, oh, what should, I, what should I say on the podcast? And I somehow did the right combination of search terms that the first result was a hit from the Heritage Foundation from September of 2019 with the headline, Refinance U.S. Debt While Rates Are Low. Yeah, mm-hmm. heritage. Done yep. good. Mm-hmm. Um, because, uh, you know, we got to refinance a lot of this debt in the next year or so. And uh, I don't know if you all know this, but um, interest rates are, are up. Uh, Nick, we have finally arrived at the moment that you and I have been talking about for uh, for years. And no, that's not the libertarian moment. Uh, it's the moment when... Sure ain't. Uh, when the service on the debt, uh, annualized is as high as military spending. And we spend a lot of money on the military. We spend more on the military than Boog Powell spends on barbecued ribs. Nick Gillespie, um, is, uh, crossing that threshold basically like the, uh, gif meme of the guy like bobbing his head and then he puts the gun to his head. Uh, no, it obviously doesn't matter, uh, anymore. And I interviewed Vernon Smith, the 2002 Nobel prize winner for economics. The, and, uh, he, uh, in that, uh, he talked about how, because the central bank is so accommodating to federal, uh, fiscal policy and whatnot, we've kind of gotten it. We're in a world where, fiscal and monetary policy, there are no constraints anymore. You know, part of the arguments, and this is one of the reasons why I think the whole debt limit debate is just kind of falling flat this time, because people, everybody knows we're not going to default on the debt and we're just going to keep printing money um, and the Fed is going to do whatever it can uh, to, you know, keep things going until, you know, this is the longest cocaine binge in history. And it's like somebody in the back of the car, it's not just they found another big bag of cocaine. They have a factory back there that is processing cocaine. Eventually, we're going to run out of gas. We're going to run out of coca, you know, and it's going to come to a halt. But I don't think people are taking it seriously yet. And this is a real issue. Going back to that idea of like mass system failure, this is the big one in a lot of ways because the real problem why deficit spending is so bad is because it absolutely reduces long-term economic growth. There's no disagreement about this. This is the one thing that all economists from all over the spectrum believe. You don't even hear monetary uh, modern monetary theory anymore because people kind of know that's a joke, but you know, they want to keep spending. But this is, you know, this is the problem. And I, I don't know what it's going to be, Matt. Maybe uh, if we um, if there's an immigrant who somehow, uh, you know, is mentally ill and takes over a shopping mall and kills somebody on a drunk driving charge and it costs us $5 as taxpayers, maybe then people will want to roll back Leviathan. But um, it's, it's uh, it's very disturbing because none of the Republican candidates are, with the possible exception of, of Mike Pence, who's not really going to matter, are talking about changing spending. I interviewed Vivek Ramaswamy, you know, the long, the moonshot Republican businessman candidate. And I said, what are you going to do about entitlement spending? Because that's what's driving deficit spending, et cetera. And he immediately pivoted to talking about economic growth, which is also a fake way out of this. Um, completely implausible. But nobody is going to be talking about cutting spending. All right, we're going to get to our listener email question of the week here in a moment. But first, funny man Andrew Heaton has long been a beloved character on such Reason TV hit videos as Libertarian Star Trek and Libertarian Star Wars. So it probably won't surprise you to discover that Mr. Heaton hosts a science fiction podcast called Alienating the Audience. Alienating the Audience is all about deep space explorations of science fiction, such as Robert A. Heinlein's free love libertarianism, the economics of Dune, Kurt Vonnegut and the warfare state, and how Star Wars and or embraces public choice theory. Guests on the show have included, but are not limited to, Peter Bogosian on what the first contact with aliens will be like, Jonathan Last from The Bulwark defending the Empire, Timothy Sandifer of the Goldwater Institute on Star Trek and the Cold War, and our own Sand Queen, 
Catherine Mangu Ward discussing the work of Dan Simmons. If you do not like science fiction, do not listen to Alienated the Audience, as there's an excellent chance your virginity will grow back. But if you do like science fiction, with some politics and economics thrown in, served fresh by a mid-level comedian, then check out Alienating the Audience wherever you get your podcasts. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder, uh, email us your brief queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Connor O-R-T Linner, who is followable on Twitter at Connor, that's two N's, O-R-T. Uh, he writes, technology seems to be leading us towards surveillance authoritarianism. Given that current governments don't have much incentive to give power back to citizens, do you think the key to a libertarian future is through technology, encryption, Bitcoin, etc.? Or do you believe that current systems can be sufficiently reshaped? If they can't be reshaped, is engaging in politics effectively a waste of time? I shouldn't ask this to Catherine, but Catherine, what do you say? Yeah, you you really s sent this one right down the uh, the slippery slope here with me. Um, so I'll give the more measured answer, which is everything's a waste of time. Like probably nothing you do matters. <laughs> but if we have to pick a thing, if we're trying political reform versus like uh, make Bitcoin a thing, I think make Bitcoin a thing is probably your better bet. And you will find in Reason Magazine kind of both sides of this coin, right? Because it actually is quite tricky to say the only hope for anything good is if a bunch of the technologies that seem to be at an acceleration point right now take off in a useful and productive way. And that includes AI and, uh, and a bunch of other things that people love to panic about. Also, though... If those same technologies are put in the hands of authoritarian monsters, not just our own, but also really, really, really bad ones like North Korea, etc. It's not going to go well for those people. Um, Ron Bailey lays awake nights, our own science correspondent lays awake nights, worried about what kind of new surveillance technologies will do in the hands of the politically powerful. And he is right to worry. But I, I still uh, affiliate myself with, you know, he did not think of this uh, by himself, but Balaji Stranavasan, who really, to me, articulated just like the we can only technologically innovate our way out of our political problems is um, or I think that's right. Like, I, I don't think we're going to solve the problems by all just getting together and talking it out. And like Matt Iglesias is going to give us a, a PowerPoint presentation and then it's going to be fine. Maybe there's no way out. But if there is a way out, it's probably some combination of uh, exciting decentralized technologies. Nick, you're an anti-nihilist uh, technology utopian. What say yes. you? And also a nihilist, but I'm against myself, Matt. Well, that's I'm like the Steppenwolf of Herman Hesse. Uh, I'm riven. Now, technology is always the solution to the status quo. And I mean, government is not the most important thing in anybody's lives, nor should it be. And if you're in a relatively free country and technology is one of the ways you keep doing that. Bitcoin, yes. Uh, all sorts of dispersed decentralized power, yes. In the 90s, at reason we were evangelizing for the internet. The internet has become the means by which people are surveilled by governments because the data is out there and they can tap directly into, you know, the, the equivalent of the central nervous system of Apple or, you know, any of what used to be called the Fang companies, although like half of them have changed their names. Um, but, uh, you know, so you get more possible surveillance, but you get more freedom. Uh, and I don't think this is complicated. It's, you know, that governments are always trying to catch up to where technology is bringing us. And that we need to keep in mind the concept of lived freedom because of the end of, you know, a monopoly on information, just something about like travel. I was flying out. I mean, I'm in uh, the Bay Area in California right now as we talk. As I was landing, I realized I had forgotten to book a flight from San Francisco to L.A. So as the plane was landing, I booked a flight to, you know, L.A. That's an increase in, in flourishing and in freedom and the ability to live however I want. All of that data also makes it easier for governments to track me. You know, we strap on our cell phones, which give, per you know, perfectly... Uh, you know, leave a trail of wherever we are and the government can access that. The, the point of politics now is to make sure 
that government doesn't get in the way of new technologies that are going to be great, like AI, um, you know, that they don't use stupid old uh, forms of antitrust to break up companies that are making our lives easier. And most importantly, that we run a shotgun on government so that they can't just access data whenever they want for whatever purpose. But I think the, the record is absolutely clear. Um, you know, including totalitarian nightmares, technology is always the means to a, uh, a freer and better and more interesting world. Governments chase on to that, and we have to beat them off with sticks, uh, you know, not unlike uh, Peter Fonda and Warren Oates and Loretta Swit did in Race with the Devil whenever the, uh, the satanic uh, people chasing them would catch up with them. They would literally beat them off the RV with sticks and golf clubs. That's the metaphor here. Matt. Have we talked about reasons robot dog divide on this podcast? There's a divide? Oh, yeah. Well. Could, well. The ro- what about the robot dogs can never die? Maybe so. Um, no, there's a divide. Pro like robot dog? I'm pro robot dog, first of all, Jesus obviously. Christ. But yeah. second. Don't call them dogs. It's. It's I think there's a real question just in general about the robotification of law enforcement, which is like, you know, humans aren't doing a great job at all. Uh, And canines, by the way, are not either. And maybe the robots seem kind of scary, but also maybe we could program them not to just rip people's faces off accidentally. I don't know. I think it's worth talking about. Nope. Uh, Peter, uh, tell Catherine why she's wrong. Uh, dogs are wonderful. Dogs and wasting time well are the two keys to he a good life. He is being life. held captive by two giant dogs, <laughs> I am, people. I you should get, understand that. And he's big. blinking, help me, help me. I am currently <laughs> sitting under a pile of bull mastiffs, about 210 pounds of dog, as I record this. And if if, uh, if I suddenly start going, oh! Ah, making like strange noises like that. It's because they have clobbered me to death. Um, uh, uh, to the reader's question, I take Ron Bailey's worries about surveillance technology seriously. I think some of today's tech probably will be used for bad ends by state powers. Like that, that does happen, and we should try to stop it. And we should be aware of that, and not just sort of dismiss that uh, that worry. But I'm a technological optimist. I think um, almost more than I'm like a. a uh, like a, a policy technocratic libertarian type like i'm just a believer in the power of technology and the, the the and the the idea of technology and the idea of the future which is an idea of technological advancement in so many ways right i think technology tends to empower individuals much more than it does state actors and state power because individuals ultimately are always freer and less constrained than bureaucrats, than politicians, than state forces. Um, and if you look at the history of technological advancement, the world since the Industrial Revolution, it is the history of advances in human freedom. And I frankly think it's hard to imagine uh, a libertarian project, at least at least as those of us on this podcast conceive of it, but really kind of uh, a libertarian project at all. It's not an accident that the libertarian idea is in some sense a new one, a post-industrial revolution idea. Um, I, I think it's hard to imagine a, a libertarian worldview as we conceive of it that does not embrace technological advancement as a, a fundamental precept of, of, of what we think is good in the world. It's also worth thinking about technology and activity that's uh, uh, technically outside the realm of politics eventually coming back around and completely disrupting politics. An example of that would be the way that technology has enabled a wonderful workaround to uh, public K-12 through systems in homeschooling. Well, homeschooling exists because there's an ecosystem around out there that you can tap into using internet technology and using the way that people can communicate with one another. And there's a whole like group of entrepreneurs that are associated around it who are really like doing interesting and wonderful work. Um, and that uh, plus the pandemic, when suddenly uh, the numbers of homeschoolers like doubled, even to cl- I think came close to tripling overnight. It has since receded somewhat, but people got to learn this new thing. Um, It wasn't necessarily the people who were doing this were engaging in politics. They were actually kind of disengaging from politics. But now, what do we see over the last 12 months, at least a half a dozen states have passed 
backpack funding, essentially, um, just saying the money that we spend on K through 12 education should go to the student. And that can include, uh, in some cases, uh, to people who are homeschooling their kids. Um, so yes, it, it does affect it uh, uh, eventually. I think um, you know the last part of the question, is engaging in politics effectively a waste of time? Um, one way that I think about this is that a lot of the, the, the ways that which we fool ourselves into thinking that we are engaging in politics is that we are getting mad passively at the television or the, the social media at what people whose politics we don't like are doing or saying about national events. Um, and that activity, I think, um, uh, is largely a waste of time and doesn't lead to any more happiness or positive policy change. Um, the more um, policy change and I think also happiness um, in political engagement happens, I think, on the local level, um, including that's where most of education is done, among other uh, events. But um, so uh, the way that we normally refer to politics, I think, is largely a consumption um, product and it's not a particularly great one. And the more that we get away from treating politics as a consumption exercise, the more productive our actual engagement with politics will be. And that's the memo. Um, all right, let's uh, get to our lightning round. Um, that's going to have to be in a lightning round. You may have heard last week that uh, former president and current Republican frontrunner uh, for president, Donald J. Trump, went on CNN uh, in a town hall setting. Uh, not long after losing a civil sexual assault and defamation lawsuit to writer E. Jean Carroll. Let's go around the table and each of us bring one takeaway. You get one about what we learned from the Trump town hall. Catherine? The people who like him still really like him. And the people who hate him are once again building a scaffold around ways to pretend like maybe he is not a viable candidate for president when in fact he definitely is. Well done in lightning fashion. Peter? Trump isn't going away, and that is in large part because he is a demand side phenomenon. And we've talked a lot about the ways in which he is sui generis, in which he is sort of a unique force of personality, and I think that's true to some extent. But he is also uh, an avatar of what Republican voters want. He, uh, he is somebody who delivers uh, in a way that other Republican politicians are going to strive to deliver and uh, take lessons from him, even if he uh, is somehow or another not in American politics anymore. So if if he's not around, uh, GOP voters are going to look for, for if not Trump, then something Trump-like, because it, it is the voters as much as the man who are driving the Trump phenomenon. Nick, what's the takeaway that you had? Uh, the ratings were not great for this. They were good for CNN, but not good for regular TV or even cable news. Uh, and subsequent events that uh, Trump hosted were uh, apparently were canceled because of lack of interest. I think we uh, the town hall was the beginning of the end for Donald Trump. Oh, bold prediction, Gillespie. Um, my uh, takeaway was that uh, it, it's pretty clear based on the reaction uh, um, in the media and also even within CNN, there's a lot of turmoil there, um, that uh, the media has gotten itself into a, a nervous breakdown and in its inability to handle Trump. Um, there's just you know too many journalists right now see their job, I think, um, as not giving him in particular a quote unquote platform even though he's a former president who is the leading contender for the presidency in the Republican Party at the moment until Gillespie's prediction becomes true, um, but that their job is to defend democracy by um, just sort of like putting a rope line uh, or a, uh, some police tape around him wherever he goes. Uh, I think that's a weird conception and of journalism, and that actually feeds into uh, a major thing that makes him attractive to his own voters. So it's a mutually reinforcing doom loop. And uh, you can see it's just going to be with us, um, uh, I think, as long as he's a character and the media continues down its own road. All right. Uh, let's uh, go to our end of podcast, what we have all been consuming in the cultural arena. Nick, why don't you lead us off? Yeah, I read uh, Kat Timpf, uh, the uh, Fox News uh, commentator and writer who's always on Gutfeld. Uh, she has a book out that was right at the top tier of the New York Times bestseller list for nonfiction. You can't joke about that. 
why everything is funny, nothing is sacred, and we're all in this together. And among the things that she does joke about are cancer, traumatic breakups, aging, dead mothers, mental illness, religion, gushing wounds, and censorship. It's a very good, fun read, but it also is getting at something that I think is really worth discussing uh, in outside of any kind of partisan context. Uh, it's a very good book. I highly recommend it. And uh, we're going to be doing an event with her on Monday, June 5th in Manhattan. Nice. So I read You Can't Joke About That by Kat Timpf. Catherine, you're Kat Timpf's mentor. Um, what did you consume? I uh, am really looking forward to checking out her book. Have not done that yet. I have been watching a show that ended in 2021 that's a 22-minute sitcom, and I don't care what you people think. I'm recommending it anyway. Um, it's called Kim's Convenience. It's uh, it's set in a Korean-owned convenience store in Toronto. And it's just, uh, you know, see the first part of our podcast. It's about actually how immigration is good, actually. And um, I guess the whole thing fell apart in 2021 because of internal fighting and probably like white people are bad or something. But um, the show itself is uh, it's funny. It's uh, it already feels like a show that you could never make uh, because there <laughs> are some racial stereotypes in it. Um, and, you know, <laughs> it started in 2016. So a reminder that the the world is moving very fast on that. But also, um, you know, just a just a kind of a good, easy, funny show. If you like me, sometimes just want to watch 22 minutes of something that is amusing before you go to sleep at night. Kim's convenience. There, that uh, for some reason uh, brings to mind um, a piece in the New York Times um, in the Sunday paper that I highly recommend. It was just really delightful. A great Mother's Day piece. It was called Generation Connie. You guys see this? Um, it was uh, uh it was all about all of these Asian American women who are named Connie because of Connie Chung. Um, and it, it didn't have to be Chinese uh, American, it could be Vietnamese, uh, Korean. Um, and uh, the woman who wrote it is herself named Connie. Um, it gets into why Connie Chung is named Connie, which itself is pretty hilarious. Her parents were from China. And uh, uh, and uh, they she was, I think, the first of their kid, uh, their family to be born in America. And they were just sort of looking for a name and they flipped through a magazine and there's an actor named Constance something. So she's Constance Chung. But everyone who's named Connie because of Connie Chung is not named Constance. Or named Connie. Anyways, um, that is uh, perfect. Really great. There is it. There is the, the daughter in this show is named Janet uh, precisely on those same vibes of like uh yeah, we uh, we just thought maybe we'd give you a name that would help you fit in. And it's like, yeah, if she was born 50 years before, like it's it's good. It reminds me that my uh, one of my friends growing up in Long Beach, um, his mom was Japanese. We'd have these uh, uh, unions between American uh, GIs who served in World War II and and uh, Japanese uh, women. Um, there's quite a few in our in our neighborhood. And uh, and uh, her name was uh, Echo was her first name. And so she changed it to Judy which I always thought was pretty great. Um, that wasn't my watch you, by the way. So I just snuck an extra one in there. And sorry for that. Uh, Peter, what did you uh, what did you consume? I read the 2021 novel, The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Petter. It is maybe not something that I would normally have picked up, but it was recommended by, by a podcast listener, actually. And uh, I am interested in debut novels, um, especially those that have genre elements and those that hit the bestseller list. And this meets all of those tests, and it is pretty enjoyable. It's a sort of a smart chick lit meets gothic mystery story um, set in two timelines, present day London and late 1700s London, uh, follows female characters in both. So in present day London, there is a 30-ish American woman who is there uh, traveling. Uh, she has an interest in history. She's supposed to be there for a 10th anniversary trip, except that right before her 10th anniversary, she found out her husband has cheated on her. So at the beginning, she's there by herself. She's gone on the trip and sort of solo. Um, this, of course, develops into further complications. And then in the past, there is a woman who runs a secret apothecary where she dispenses poison and sometimes other remedies to women who need help including, in some cases, help murdering their husbands. Uh, so in the past setting, there's also a young girl who ends up intertwined in the story. And it's a sort of a murder mystery thriller type thing. Um, but along with uh, a story about finding yourself and following your passions and 
you know, figuring out what you really want in life and also kind of investigating the past and, and like enjoying learning about something new in your surroundings. And so it's just a readable, satisfying page turner. And I just want to say thank you to the listener who uh, who sent in this recommendation. I am uh, recommending something that it sounds like it's the kind of thing that Catherine or Nick would have already recommended, but that I would have forgotten about because I stroked out. Um, it's the uh, pop-up museum called Museum of Failure. When do you guys do this one already? No. Really? Well, that's exciting. Um, so it's a uh, pop-up museum in Brooklyn, New York, in the Industry City, which is uh, over by some old like port warehouses and stuff that's been refashioned and reshaped called the Museum of Failure. It's a, it's a um, pretty small uh, uh, area that shows a bunch of uh, products that failed and the spirit of it is to make you kind of rethink about failure as actually the path to success or the price of innovation and and whatnot um in fact it's so heavy in that way that i kind of found it annoying but what i found most annoying about the museum of failure and i do recommend that people go um despite all of that is that you when you're in this industry city uh place where they have uh, all these big big different buildings um uh everything on the website says it's in building two um, and then you walk all around <laughs> building two and it's just not there. It's in building seven, um, which uh, really exists. And, uh, and it's really, really difficult to find in the place that it is. So I, I found that kind of hilarious museum of failure failed. To I was going to say the irony, <laughs> the irony, is deep. but it has stuff like the mini tell, <laughs> which my wife did not oh, like, yes. uh, it's inclusion there at all. The French, uh, proto internet terminal um that was great uh it had a trabant uh, i had an entire room dedicated to elon musk which is kind of interesting so it had the, his successes but his failures and pointing out that the failures uh outnumber the successes so it makes you want to think about the full picture i uh, had maybe too much donald trump and all the trump stakes and whatnot and and uh, elizabeth holmes from theranos um my favorite two awful things in there were uh, Seagram's. <laughs> Seagram's in the 90s thought, you know what? So many people like a beer and a shot. Let's make that into one drink um, and, and call it Old Breed. <laughs> that just <laughs> uh, didn't work out. Uh, and there was apparently- Was it a separate <coughs> shot glass in the can no. or was it just a- just like whiskey-ish beer. I mean, it was like honestly, from, from like so many failures, it was just yeah. way ahead of its time. Right, because yeah, these days the true. the 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 canned like uh, prepackaged cocktail and bottled beverage market is just blowing up. Like I was in a convenience store the other day that had a huge number of uh, pre bottled and pre canned cocktails, but they also had Jack Daniels and Coke in a can. Just it's like you don't so you don't have to buy Coca-Cola and Jack Daniels. You can just get Jack and Coke all to right because it's way too much work to to pour some Jack Daniels. in. We're going to see a real productivity. Why are people trying to one. reform politics when Jack and Coke pre-mixed in a can already exists? Technology yeah. right, is, this the is answer. In this the is, uh, 70s, Matt, you'll be happy to know that you could buy Harvey Wallbanger cocktails, uh, New Jersey, oh. what became New Jersey transit trains Man, for the with Galliano commute home to hell. Yeah. No, it was all in the little can. And you would shake it and uh, just chug it. I, uh, this is the nice. future I, um, that libertarians want. I'm yeah. always here for 1982 Brewers references, despite the pain that they inflicted on oh, yeah. my particular yeah. team. The other, Harvey's wall bangers. The other uh, uh, device that I uh, liked because I hadn't seen it before was that apparently uh, 12 years ago, they ha or 13, they had a thing called the Twitter Peak, like P-E-E. P E E K. Um, it was a two hundred dollar device so that you could tweet. <laughs> like, wow. That's brilliant. Uh, but anyways, museum failure. Check it out. It's a pop up museum. It, it goes until mid June, I think. Here, if you're in New York, uh, it'll probably and has reappeared in a lot of other cities. So uh, you can look for it online, and it'll tell you where it's going next. Presumably, um, kind of interesting. It's a little bit annoying, um, but some fun stuff to look at, including if you've never seen a Trabant in the flesh. They're always beautiful. And this one was a festive turquoise, which I always appreciate. All right. That's all the festivities we have in time for here on the Reason Roundtable podcast.
podcast. Um, if you like what we do, please go to reason.com slash donate and give us a non uh, or taxable donation or tax-free donation, however you say these things. Um, all of our podcasts can be found at reason.com slash podcasts. Um, all of our events can be found, including the uh, New York series of events at Reason.com uh, events. Uh, Nick, you mentioned the Cat Timp speakeasy coming up. Are there any other highlights from the Gillespie multiverse that we should be aware of? Uh, yeah, that's on Monday, June 5th. Go to Reason.com and sign up now because tickets are limited and they are going, you know, kind of like a Jack and Coke in a can. Yeah. Uh, Pre-made. Uh, but also on May 22nd, uh, the next Soho Forum is a debate between Gene Epstein, the director of the Soho Ooh. Forum, and Andrew Koppelman, a book that critiqued contemporary libertarianism as essentially spoiled by Murray Rothbardism. So those two are going to be uh, fighting, you know, like, uh, you know, like dogs and cats. Who's going to moderate uh, with Dr. Gene? Uh, uh, they have a, I, you know, I'm very sorry to say that I won't be there. I was supposed to be the guest moderator. But uh, they got somebody much, much better, a man, a god, called Judge Andrew Napolitano. Oh, dear. Will be the guest moderator, what so uh, check that out. All at, at reason.com slash events or reason.com slash newsletters and go to the NYC events and sign up for that great newsletter. Brilliant. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll catch you next week. Goodbye.